Congratulations, America. We did it again. The majority of us can't come up with a thousand dollars. Brian, I am so excited about this topic, no, but I'm not, not excited Nobody about this. Nobody gets stat. excited no, about this. This is what I'm excited about. I'm excited because I think we can change it. I think we have a meaningful opportunity here at the Money Guy Show to change this statistic that we see year in and year out and year in and year out about how bad the average American is with money. So I'm excited at the opportunity to change this awful statistic. Bo, it got to be an internal joke around here because for the last, I'd say, month and a half, I would ask Daniel. I'd be like, Daniel, is the new data out? Has the new <laughs> Daniel, data been published? The because bank rate has been publishing every year since 2015 how many Americans struggle to come up with $1,000. And this is fascinating to me. So it's one of those things where I wanted, and we, we put it up on the screen mm -hmm. here. You can see consistently America is around 60%, yep. meaning 60% of Americans struggle to come up with $1,000, meaning only 40% are above mm -hmm. that number. That's why when we do levels of wealth, guys, if you have $1,000, you are better than the majority that's of exactly Americans, right. and that's a sad state of affairs. So I've been asking Daniel, I want to know at the end of 2022, what is going on in America? And and look, we were taking odds on it. I, I actually thought because of the downturn, mm -hmm. the number was going to pop well above 60% because you can see it wasn't too long ago, 2016, it was 63%, 2015, 62, even as close as um, 2021, it was at 61%. But then last year, um, we were 56%. Yep. And, I, and I, put, I, I put a lot of that thinking that post-pandemic, as you know, the the, the, some of that down, money, because I know that be savings hard, right? rates went up during the pandemic. Credit card debt went way down during the pandemic. I was thinking that this was the year that maybe things changed. But, Bo, give them the big reveal. Here is what we know with a new number. This is from Bankrate. As of January 2023, 57% of Americans have less than $1,000 in savings. 57% of Americans, if something happened at their house or there was a medical bill or there was a car issue or there was... Something that came up, they could not come up with $1,000 without going into debt to do so. That's terrifying. That's just, a, I can't imagine living in that way where any unknown unknown can completely derail your entire financial life. But I don't like to just end things with negative information, sure. Bo. I mean, because it is sad that the close to 60% of Americans can't come up with $1,000. So let's see if we can turn that frown upside mm -hmm. down and turn it into a smile. And I didn't want to take away from your time. I mean, that's something we know time is the most valuable resource. And so there's all kind of content out there. We've even done it where you go start doing DoorDash. You could start doing side hustles. All kinds of side hustles. That stuff's out there. We were like, no, we want to come up with realistic ways we can get you to $1,000 without really taking away mm -hmm your time. And we're going to give you three of them. Here's the first one that uh, we actually love. We've actually done a lot of content on this in the past. We've said, hey, you could, sh you should consider getting rid of what we like to call your ungrateful service providers. The folks who are more than happy to reward new customers coming in, but they don't have, uh, they don't, uh, always treat their current customers with the same sort of excitement. By the way, this is this is one of those, those skill sets that was brought out of necessity during the 2008 Great Recession. Uh, I've joked with Bo; he knows it was far from a joke because it was it was so bad that you had to do it and laugh, otherwise you would have cried. Right. It was the fact that I was actually looking out the window in 2008 and nine. Trying to figure out, I could plant corn how, on some how, of this land. How many crops? I was trying to I figure out, and I, you know, I, I, I told Bo, "Hey, I, I, I'm not firing you, but we might have to renegotiate re because things are tough." And and what I actually did when I was trying to cut things down as close to the bone as possible of my own personal expenses is I started going through my service providers, and, and let's talk about these. This this is. Your auto mm -hmm. and your homeowner's insurance, there's a reason that you can't turn on the TV and you, you see all the Geico, the progressives. It's because these are service models that reward your, people, new customers mm -hmm. versus keeping happy, good paying existing customers. So you will see a lot of churn in this. You need to be paying attention to this. You need to be going every probably three years mm -hmm shopping your insurance to make sure you don't need to change carriers because this is hundreds of dollars worth of opportunity. And so if you're needing money, 
do not look past these ungrateful service providers. What's some other options yeah, with this? I, I think what's so interesting about this is when, when our insurance renewals come up, most of us default. Hey, whatever I did last year, I'll just do that again. Whatever company I was last year, this is one of the reasons why we recommend if you are buying homeowners, buying auto insurance, maybe you want to look at a non-captive agent because a non-captive can go shop all of your insurances across a number of different companies. And like Brian said, every two to three years, you ought to be doing that. Don't just default to what you did last year because you may be surprised that there are some savings out there. Another one that we see all the time are like utilities, mm -hmm. like things that we use every single day, our cell phones being one. Just because you've been a customer with your provider for the last decade does not mean that you're getting the very best deal out there. So you ought to continue to call them and say, hey, I saw this commercial. Well, no one watches commercials, but I saw this Google ad that came up when I was surfing the web and it said, you're offering this for new people signing up. I've been with you guys for a decade. Can I get in on this deal? And I think you will be amazed to find often these service providers will allow you to do that just simply by asking. And if they don't, the second best answer you can get is always no. So go advocate for yourself. I think that's a very valuable one. Here, here's a, number two. This is one, I think when we're in periods of abundance, we have a tendency to reward ourselves with a little more consumption. Yep. Now that we're in tighter times and we want to find ways to find more resources, and, and this is one that I've also seen in my own mm -hmm. household, sell your stuff. Yep. I mean, this is one of those things I know when we were in the... Um, child baby phase uh -huh. a lot of these kids clothes you can you can resell Absolutely. i know a lot of the stuff in your closet you can resell i mean facebook marketplace i it's mean we, we just did a, a, a whole redecorating here in the office if you come do the studio tour you'll see the new lobby you'll see the way we we've, we've decorated some of the offices and stuff and we had some other furniture that was no longer going to be of use mm -hmm. to us our decorator was able to go on Facebook Marketplace and recoup some of the costs. Yep. I was shocked at how easy it was for her to go and, and, and process these transactions. And then, Bo, you brought up, and I thought this was fascinating because I plan on doing this myself. Mm -hmm. What's the hanger method? Yeah, there's a great thing. A lot of us, we end up buying clothes and accumulating clothes, and they just kind of end up storing. But if you're like us, if you're like me and Brian, we wear about the same seven outfits every week, right? We just kind of rotate through them. So one thing that you can do, this is an interesting thing that I've seen people do, uh, take a hanger and at the beginning of the year, put it on the far left of your, uh, of your closet, on the far left. Every time you wear clothes, every time you wash clothes, put it on the other side of that hanger. Well, if you make it all the way to the end of the year, anything still on the right side that you've not worn, that you haven't broken out, maybe it's time to get rid of that. And what I think is amazing that Facebook Marketplace has kind of opened my mind on are things that I think are worthless. I should just throw it away. Oh, no one would like that. People are willing to buy that. Oh, that t-shirt, that collared shirt, that polo. Yeah, four bucks, five bucks, I'll do that. And it's really, really easy. You put it on the porch, they come pick it up, they Venmo you. No harm, no foul. I think you'd be amazed to figure just by cleaning the clutter out of your closet, out of your attic, out of your garage, how quickly you can build up those extra dollars. It pains me to say this part out loud because you you pride yourself in your athleisure wear. Did uh -huh. I say that right? Uh-huh. That stuff holds its value. It does. It is amazing. It does. If you go look at Lululemon or Legends or some of these other things, the used marketplace on that stuff right. is kind of amazing. So so if you have something that's not being used, maybe your New Year's resolution was to load up on the gym stuff, but now you're not <laughs> using it, um, you, th there's a market out there. Look, I, there was a multi-level marketing vacuum sales uh -huh. company yep. that all my neighbors went through it. I. I sat through the presentation and then went on eBay and bought the exact you same do, vacuum course. cleaner for like practically a, a third of what they were yep. selling these things for. Pay attention. Well, if you're trying to get rid of something, there's probably a market for it. We, you know, I talk about FTE has FYI. Mm -hmm. People don't realize Daniel also has a side hustle. He does. He was recently profiled on another YouTube channel, and he has been crushing it with cleaning out. Now uh -huh. he's a, he actually has a business, but it just shows you that there are you there are there's a marketplace out there. Use this technology to turn it into something. And then here's the third way that you can come up with this. Now this it might seem common sense, but a lot of us, even though it's common sense, we don't practice it. Figure out how to practice better forced scarcity or even forced scarcity over a smaller time frame. Maybe you're doing something as simple. Hey, you know what? 
We've been eating out a ton. We're going all these different directions. We're going to just not eat out for a month. And you'll be amazed at how quickly just not making those consumption decisions will allow you to build up that $1,000 that potentially is missing inside of your now, budget. Now, Bo, you came into today's content meeting to, to set up show, and you said something that was pretty good. Now, I didn't fact check your math, so sure. somebody will pull out the calculator and check this. But you said right now if you want to sure. get to $1,000, not in a year, but in just six months, mm -hmm. You said it was $41 a week? Yeah, here's what I did. I did uh, six months times four weeks is 24. 1,000 divided by 24 comes out to $41.67 uh, $41 a week. So let's back into now step three, which is practice a month of forced scarcity. Because mm -hmm. this is something, because if you try it out for a month, I also know this is, we're still in the, we're in the afterglow of the New Year's resolution. So maybe working out four times a day didn't end up working out for you. But it doesn't mean that maybe you could say, hey, I'm going to start trimming down on how much I go out and eat fast food, not just for the budget, but mm -hmm. also for the health part of sure. it. Oh, I, I think another thing that I try to do at the beginning of the year is I cut out the junk food in the pantry because oh, it, it seems like that creeps in there. If you if you are now look, I'll tell you the other side is I start adding fresh fruit and vegetables, other things. More expensive. The, 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 the <laughs> Unhealthy stuff is a heck of a lot cheaper, the processed stuff, than the healthy stuff. But I'm just saying for a moment, if you just wanted to cleanse yourself of all the stuff that sits in your pantry that you don't really need, if you're trying to reaffirm some of those healthy habits that you did in your New Year's resolution, this is another way. And then, Bo, you put on a third one on here, cutting the cord. Yeah, some of the things we pay subscriptions for, maybe it's Netflix, maybe it's Prime, maybe it's Hulu, maybe it's Disney+, Plus, or maybe it's some of the bigger ticket subscriptions, maybe you're paying for that gym membership, but you're not actually going. Well, that $200 a month compounded over a couple months can really add up. So you should do an inventory of the things that you have on auto pay, auto renew, auto subscribe and say, hey, do I need to be using that? Or do I need to be using that over the next six months? Or should I purge myself of that, get my finances back to where they need to be, and then start figuring out what which of those pieces do I wanna start adding back into my life? So what do you got to lose, guys? Let's get you above the 60% of Americans that can't come up, or 57% to be exact for this year, of Americans that can't, can't come up with $1,000. We gave you three practical steps. If you can just start building $41 yep. or save $41 a week for the next six months, you will be in the good side of this stat. So let's make it happen. We gave you three steps. I'm your host, Brian Preston. All right, so you guys know we love coming up with ideas for how to help you come up with $1,000, but maybe your questions go a little bit deeper. Maybe there's something more nuanced that you want to know about. Well, that is what this is for. Right now, we have the team out on the wings collecting your questions. We love to load you up with the information that you want. So if you have a question, get it in the chat. And with that, Producer Reby, I'm going to throw it over to you. First up, we've got Tina. She says, could you guys explain exactly what a financial mutant is? Mm. For some context, um, her situation is our net worth is $2.5 but I'm not sure where we stand in the foo. I'm a 40-year-old stay-at-home mom, and we want to retire at 62. Uh, first off, let me just say, Tina, uh, 40 years old, $2.5 million saved up. You are crushing it, right? You are absolutely killing it from a financial standpoint. It certainly sounds like you are on your way to being where you want to be. But that was not your question, was where am I at? Your question is, is how do I know if I'm a financial mutant? What is a financial mutant? Well, I think one of the things that's really important to talk about is a lot of times we'll throw terms out. Like, like we might say someone's a prodigious accumulator of wealth. That just means that there's a mathematical number that we can apply to someone's net worth to say, where they are relative to their income, right? That's something sort of math-minded that you can do. What I think is interesting, Brian, that I'd love for you to weigh on is financial mutant is more of a mindset. It's a mentality. It's not math. And so what you may find is that financial mutants come in all shapes and sizes, and they are littered all throughout the financial life cycle, whether you're someone who is still working through college or maybe you're that person who retired 10 years ago, all of those people can be a financial mutant if they have the right mindset. Well, let me give you a few indicators. I knew from a pretty early age I process money a lot differently than my peer group in the world. And the fact that, um, I mean, I came up with the $7 date night when I was in high school. 
It's amazing that I have a wife and children for, based upon this mindset, but it does show the difference. I mean, if you ask any of my high school friends, they, they made fun of my George Costanza wallet because I always had coupons in it and all kind of other things. But, uh, but here's what I, I figured out also. A dollar in my hands was going to go 3 to 10% further mm-hmm. than everybody else's. And, it, and, and it's hard to explain this. And you'll, you'll, this is when you have a superpower to realize that you just don't waste money that comes into your possession. You look at the opportunity that every dollar could become if it becomes the best version of itself. And that's why I always tell people it's a mindset, but it's also you can't look past the value of what mm-hmm. a dollar is. And um, that's why you hear people. Um, I was watching some some content recently, and I think we might have even reacted to it where they're talking about wealthy people are more scared to be poor. Yeah. And that's why they're so cheap when they go to restaurants or they do other things. And I was like, no, I, I don't think I think there is entrepreneurial fear. Don't get me wrong. But I also think there's a reason that, you know, you see wealthy people not fall prey to some of the trends out there is because they, they know what the intrinsic value of what a good is and what brings them happiness. Tina, if you can understand these skill sets that your mindset, and obviously having two and a half million dollars at 40 years of age, I get the feeling because it's also I, the financial mutant part is when the market's down, you get excited because you know you're buying in that day or the next day when markets. That's also another indicator you process the world differently and you bear fruit from that. Yeah, I think it's interesting, Brian. I want to be I want us to be clear here though cuz a lot of time you talked about when the $7 date and some uh, financial we used to we used to equate in our minds financial mutant to tightwad. Like it was this idea that oh you you got to be tight and you got to pinch every penny. Tightwad nation. That that no, was our thought. No. And we rec- that's not true. Yeah. A financial mutant is someone who recognizes when it makes sense to be a tightwad, but when it also makes sense to recognize value and when it's okay to spend your money. They simply think about money differently. So there might be stages in your life where you are a tightwad and that does accurately describe you. Just because your financial circumstances change, just because later on maybe you buy the nicer car or you move into the nicer home or you go on the nicer vacation, it does not mean that you are no longer a financial mutant. It just means that you have matured in your financial walk to where being a financial mutant looks different for you. You understand incremental decisions. Like you understand why it matters if I'm doing pre-tax 401k versus Roth 401k. Why does it matter if I'm not just thinking about asset allocation, but I'm also thinking about asset location. A financial mutant understands that the small little marginal decisions over time can have a huge impact. And and by the way, what I love about being a financial mutant is that it, if you think about a curve with with put put my face on it, with my different age groups, uh-huh. I mean you can be a, a, an eighteen year old and be a financial mutant Absolutely. because you process even though you don't have money, you don't have resources, but you're already seeing how money is a tool and only a tool and how you can maximize that. A thirty year old once again see my face on the line. Yep, you can be a financial mutant just like you can be with Tina, who's got two and a half million dollars. I don't want somebody to mishear this and say this is only something that the elite can be in. No, no, not at all. It is not that. We are an open invitation club, but only a f- small select group can get in because their mindset, even if they don't have a lot, processes what the value, the opportunity of every dollar is. That's the superpower. Love it. Very good answer. Thanks so much for your question, Tina. Hopefully that helps you out. Let's move on to John Michael's question. Hey, John Michael, friend of the show. He said, I stopped paying extra on my mortgage because it is at 2.1%. And now I take that extra and I put it in a savings account paying 3.5%. When or do I ever move that money and interest earned over to my mortgage? Yeah, so a lot of people are in this situation right now. Uh, If we bought homes in the past couple of years or we refinanced in the past couple of years, we recognize that the mortgage cost on our homes is lower than the interest we are earning on our savings account. John Michael says he's earning three and a half percent. I think some savings accounts now are even paying over 4%. And so you're thinking mathematically, okay, this must be what that means. So long as that arbitrage exists, I should keep the money in savings and then keep paying and then keep paying the minimum on my mortgage. But as soon as it shifts, as soon as my mortgage rate is higher than my interest rate, well, then I should throw all the money at the mortgage. Is that the right way to think about it? Is no, there something it, missing? It's, and, and look, I feel at a little bit of a, we'll call it an advantage because I know who John Michael mm-hmm. is and we've met. He's done the studio tour. 
Um, the guide to this, the answer to this, and you know I'm going to do it. I'm going to hold it up. I'm going to make the cool sound, the financial order of operations. Yes, because, they, look, paying down, because we do have an arbitrage situation. We, we know that you have a 2.1% mortgage. Cash is paying more than 4% if you put it in the right place without the risk. Mm-hmm. There is, a, you're like, whoa, that's a great opportunity. But there's a balance here. Remember, there's, there's two components here. There's getting wealthy, and then there's keeping your wealth. And that's what the financial order of operations tries to maximize that entire journey so that if you don't have your emergency reserves, if you don't have the foundation of your investments with your Roth and your retirement plans through your employer and the hyper accumulation and pre-funding all your kids' education and other goals, then you don't get to move on to paying off the 2.1. But however, I don't want somebody who's approaching the threshold Mm -hmm. of retirement post 45, meaning you can actually see the runway of the future ahead of you. And you got to figure out how do you glide this thing down and how do you keep your wealth? How do you minimize the risk of the long term? Because you want to enter retirement completely debt free. You're going to take all those components and that's where step number nine of the financial order of operations might say, hey, look, if you've already been saving and accumulating and you have the build the wealth by saving and investing 25%, but you can spot your retirement threshold in the near, not too distant future because you're over 45. Now we're at the point of it might be okay to pay off Mm -hmm. the 2.1% interest rate, even though you can make more in cash. So I I, I will tell you my own situation. Y'all know. I have pretty much paid off my house. Very Me close. and Bo, because I, I I told Bo I was going to be completely debt-free by age 50. Um, so I am so close. But then this whole arbitrage situation with interest rates happened. And so what I've done is, is I've quit hyper-paying down my mortgage. Um, I'm just now rounding up my monthly mortgage payment a few extra b- <laughs> hundred bucks. You still got to get a little bit well, extra. I just, <laughs> I'm not a minimum payment type of guy. I'm just not. That is not my mentality on anything, even though I know that those few hundred extra dollars are not getting maximized. They are working towards that component of lowering the risk so I can keep my wealth. Um, that's the way I would look at it, John Michael, is, is use the financial order of operations as your as your as your marker guide to, to kind of know where you are in the journey, but then try to figure out how you balance keeping your mm-hmm. wealth as you're in that phase, at that phase of success. Love it. And I, I will, I'm just going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to throw it out there. That's good. That's good. I'm going to throw it out there. If you're someone who's sitting on cash and you're not earning some of these rates that were now, yeah. look, th- we're recording this in January, or uh, I'm sorry, February of 2023. So we know that interest rates can change. If you're not out there getting at least like three and a half, four, four and a half percent, that's available out there in the marketplace without a whole lot of work. So don't make sure you command your army of dollar bills. If you're not getting those savings rates, ask in the chat, they'll tell you where to go, find places to park that cash because every little bit helps a ton over the long term. Love it. Thanks for your question, John Michael. Hey, an internal note, Katie, I want to do a short on the different places you can do cash reserves. But right? look at that. Y'all are all just part of a show meeting right there. Yeah, well, Every single I mean, one of you. I just don't want the moment. And before, while we're, I know this will stay, probably stay up, but I saw I my pillow. I saw the oh. pillow go. Hang on. Quick, Brian cut the bow, Nate. <laughs> no, it's all right. I think everybody understands this is what happens when you do live streams. No, no, no. We're professionals. It's part of the fun. You know, round pillows roll off of flat backs. <laughs> Maybe we'll get you a square pillow. No, it's, it's like it's like so. Did Confucius say that one? <laughs> Never Brian done. Preston Benjamin original. Franklin. Never done. I mean, I, I felt it slide off. I was like, dang god. I watched it too. Oh, it just got a roll. Oh, awesome. Okay. All right. Ready for the next question? Yes, yes, ma'am. Let's do it. Jacob has a question for you guys. He said, "I'd like to hear the money guy opinion on mutual funds with front end load fees. Is it a red flag if an advisor wants to put you in these?" Yes. Is it a red flag? <laughs> Got it. Okay. Here, so, so, what, so what is Jacob talking about? So a lot of mutual funds, when you go to buy them from an advisor, they might be what are called loaded funds. And a lot of them are A shares, which means they're loaded on the front end. So you want to go buy $100 of this fund. Well, the first 3%, 5%, whatever the commission is, will go to the advisor right off the top. You pay a front end commission to do that. Here's the ultimate question that I asked Jacob. I don't want to say, and Brian, you may be more polite than, or you may be less polite than I am. Whether it's good or bad, the question I would ask is why? Why am I buying a commissioned fund? And by the way, commission funds come in all types. They're the front end loaded. They're also back end loaded. And then there's some that are just loaded every single year. So you want to make sure you understand what you're, what you're buying. 
I would make the argument that whatever that fund is, there are probably some options available to you that are much less expensive, both from a commission standpoint as well from an, as well as from an ongoing internal expense standpoint. So the question that Jacob ought ask is if the advisor is recommending that, I'd ask the question, why are you recommending this share class of this fund as opposed to this index fund that's no load, yada, yada, yada? What would you say to that? I always like to give experience shares because I think this is, you have to be careful because a lot of people I think are like me when I was in my early 20s. I had graduated with an accounting degree. I was working in public accounting. I had just read The Millionaire Next Door and The Wealthy Barber on fire for this concept of personal finance and mm -hmm. building wealth that my parents had not been able to build and, um, and I, I wanted to start making, I wanted to walk the walk. I wanted to start making the money work. So I didn't know where to start. So I, fortunately, there was a CPA at my firm whose roommate was selling um, mutual funds and other things. So I bought the regional bank fund from John Hancock, mm -hmm. Class B. Ooh. Oof. And then the John Hancock Special Equities um, class B. Mm. Um, so as you can see, I didn't know what I was doing, but, but here's the thing, even though those were inappropriate products and the reason why is because class B, you never see these things anywhere. They, I don't even know how these things were legal. Um, they, they tried to mimic, um, index funds mm -hmm. or no, no load, um, funds. And the fact they had no front end commissions, but, um, they would ding you up to 6% if you sold it in the, on the back, it, end. On the back end. So think about all that compounding growth, of the 90s, and then somebody gets to take 5 6%, depending on how many years you held it. Um, but that's not where the ba bad stopped, mm -hmm. is that they also had an internal expense ratio on a lot of these funds of over 2.5%. Mm -hmm. Insane. Yep. Because if you think about now with index funds being basically free, that's 2.5% of performance every year you have to recapture just to catch where the market yep. is. So, I, But I, here's here's my point. I wouldn't have become the financial mutant who has created all this without something starting the cast and rolling the ball forward um, of, of, of lighting the fire of my curiosity. So I'm not mad at the person that sold me that. But um, I, I, so that's why the first thing I was going to say is know thyself is that that was the thing that I didn't know any better. So there was actually value added to me by that salesperson because he got the ball started to where I then I wanted to move to step two, which is I started doing my homework. I started researching. I started, and now that's what I was going to say. The third point is, is it is the modern world, has it solved your problem of researching this and the fact that you can watch content like the Money mm -hmm. Guy Show and other people like that where we will load you up with free information on all these new products? Because Vanguard, like I, when I first, if you go back in our archives, I guarantee you there's a show when I first started talking about index funds to the public Guys, it was not the majority of people invested in index no, funds. It was close. actually active managers, and, and active managers were usually sold by wholesalers and then commissioned agents who had you know A share, B share, C shares, and so forth, all the, the alphabet soup. Um, now that's different. The majority of people are buying mm -hmm. index funds as their investment, so the world and the market has shifted. So you've got to do your homework. We can't make specific recommendations to you. This is an education show. It's not a you come and we tell you what to do because that would be inappropriate mm -hmm. since we're licensed people. But I do think the modern world has created a lot of opportunity for you to do your own due diligence so you can figure out who you are, what you need. And then is there an index fund? Is there a low cost provider? Because Vanguard's, the Fidelity's, the Charles Schwab's and they're kind of all in solutions mm -hmm has really opened up the world yep. a lot differently. But but that doesn't mean that there's not going to be some commission person that didn't get your 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 journey started. So I, I guess I'm a little more grace-filled. Well, that's what, you make a great point, because I think it's important. Just because someone recommends a commission product or someone tries to sell you an insurance policy does not mean that that person is a bad person. Uh, at the end of the day, no one's going to care about your money more than you care about your money. So you have to be the educated consumer. Don't just assume because someone's recommending that for you that they don't have your best intention at heart. They just may not know. At the beginning of my career, I started on the insurance commission side of things, and that's all that I knew. And so everything that seemed like an appropriate solution until I became educated, until I actually figured out that there was 
more out there were better solutions out there so you have to be an advocate for yourself if we're really cool with our editing skills maybe in a highlight we could put this i watched a great short over the weekend and i thought it was hilarious because they would play this where they said the difference between cuts and construction between a framer and they showed somebody who basically used their hand as the ruler and then sliced it with ripped it through with a saw and it was had an angle and stuff and then they did uh, a a trim specialist and uh -huh. they had somebody actually take a ruler and then they drop the saw down because I, you know, cause trim are going to do angles and they're going to be so exact. And then they had furniture maker and they had the, the, the band, you know, the saw that you push in on the table saw and had really good lines on that. And I thought this is exactly what you just mm -hmm. described is that that person, cause a lot of insurance agents, a lot of commission people, they're only going to sell what they know. And, and that's why it's up to you to go educate yourself. So you know if they actually got the tools yep. in their tool belt that's actually going to give you the best product for your financial life. And um, and it just it made me think of that because it just entertained me how the same problem can be solved three different ways and you get three different results. So it's on you to kind of know what's out there so you can maximize it. Love it. Awesome. Let's move on to the next question from Kevo45. He says, if I have six months saved in a money market as an emergency fund, would it be prudent to invest a portion of it in a growth and income fund? These funds are not as vital, volatile and have dividends. Did he say growth and income fund? Growth and income fund. <laughs> well, Kevo, here's, here's the problem. Uh, nothing sucks until it sucks, right? But that's, that's the way that life happens. So, oh, growth and income funds, they are less aggressive and they are, you know, they're not going to have all that volatility. Go back to 2008, right? 2008, we all lived it. We were experiencing this. Everything got its teeth kicked in. The safe stuff got its teeth kicked in. The risky stuff got its teeth kicked in. The purpose of your emergency fund is there for an emergency. That's right. You guys nailed it. It's supposed to be there when emergencies come. So if based on your analysis, based on what you've put together, you and your household need six months of living expenses in an emergency fund, then that emergency fund needs to stay true liquid cash. If you start trying to get cute with it, if you start trying to, oh, go out there and chase yield in other places, I'm worried that when that uh-oh happens, when that unknown, unknown, unforeseen market circumstance comes, and you need to go access that capital, it's at the same time where all of a sudden that growth and in income fund kind of, you know, you know what it in the bed, right? And you need those dollars and they are not there. I don't think, I am not, uh, in my opinion, it does not make sense to get cute with your emergency fund. Two things popped in my brain. I, my brain works in such weird ways, especially after four hours of sleep. So it's um, it's kind of, maybe I ought to force not sleep so I get these creative ideas. But it's, um, first of all, 1998 wants their their mutual fund back. Because, I mean, when is the last time you heard growth in income? I, yeah, I mean, it true. reminds me of, true. I mean, my, my sister-in-law, she won't mind me picking on her because she listens to the show sometimes and she knows it's true. I, I looked at her 401k. One time, this is back when we first uh, first helped her on it, and I was like, "How did? What was the what was the decision making on all these different funds during your four hundred one k?" She goes, "I chose everything that had the word growth in it." It says growth. It's got to be good. <laughs> and by the way, it's not just my sister in law because there is a famous financial person that we have a ton of respect for. That back in the nineties, his plan was four quadrants with it was like growth funds, growth and income funds, uh -huh. international growth funds. And then I think it was like bonds. Yeah, and that's right. that was, that right. was the pie chart. It was like these, these, <laughs> these four funds. So everybody fell victim to this. So when I see growth and income, by the way, if you don't know what growth and income is, historically, that's a 60, 40 mm -hmm. split, 60% in equities, 40% in um, conservative stuff. It means that you, you get something, but nobody's probably graded anything in the, in, in the investment. Right. So just Very be generous. careful. With that, you don't see a lot of these because now we look at large cap index funds, you look at mid cap, small cap, international, so forth. But here's the question I have for Kevo 45 that, before I went on my tangent is you built up six months of emergency reserves. That probably came from you practicing that oh so important component of discipline, meaning you lived on less than you made and a poor, and, you know, and that, that created savings or this margin that you could then use the, the component of time to build wealth. Why can't you, now that you have your six months, look at the way you're living your life and say, hey, what was now, what was being saved to emergency reserves, whether it's a $600 a month, $1,000 a month, that money ought to now be redirected into my investment accounts and look at the financial order of operations. I'll hold it up. 
I get a good sound in there. You know, pull up the financial order of operations, figure out what needs the bucket for the next dollar to go into so you can maximize that journey. And then, you know, start making the money work. Do a dollar cost averaging. Maybe it's a Roth IRA. Maybe it's your employer plan. Maybe it's your first after-tax brokerage account that you're going to start buying investment index funds and so forth into. Pay attention to that. That's probably there's some margin in your life, Kevo, that allowed you to maximize that emergency reserves. And you're now ready to move to the next step in that, in that wealth building process. Agreed. Fantastic. Thanks, Kevo, for your question. Let's move on to Mark's question. He says, what do you all typically include in your 20 to 25% savings rate that you talk about? HSA contributions, especially if I'm investing it, or what about 529 contributions? What all is included? Oh, that's a great question. Awesome. Um, I'm going to answer I'm going to answer very simply and broad, Brian, and then I'll let you kind of fill in fill in the de- details. Uh, we say that uh, in order to be a financial mutant moving along in your financial journey, we want you to save 20 to 25% of your gross income for the future. And that for the future, I think, is really where your question is. In my mind, when we're talking about saving 25%, we're talking about those future dollars that are going to provide for you later on. Those are those dollars that one day you are going to live off of. So the things that would go into that bucket are like your 401k contributions and your after-tax brokerage and your Roth IRA and your Those types of accounts are going to be your money later on. If you're investing in HSA, I would even argue that HSA contributions, if you are part of the 4% that's doing that, could indeed fall in that 25%. However, when it comes to things like 529s, again, this is my opinion. I'll be curious to hear what you say. In my mind, that's a prepaid future expense. My kids are going to go to college at some point in the future. I'm not really saving for myself. I'm saving for them. So I think 529 contributions would not fall into the 20, 25%. Brian, I'd be curious to know your thoughts on that. And then what about like your employer if you're, or if other people are giving you money? How mm-hmm. does that factor in as well? So the hold up, the financial order of operations, it is step two through seven is part of the 20, 25%. Mm-hmm. Now look, you got high interest debt. That, that's the only outlier here that's not really counting because you got to get that, that in order. I just don't going. want you to miss the, the free money. But it is two through seven of the financial order of operations go to moneyguy.com slash resources if you want that free deliverable yourself that's what the 20 to 25 percent in there hsas yeah sure count that because there's a good opportunity that could be a stealth retirement account as we all know as well unless you're using it though unless you're using it as a clearing account that's a good point 529s is a footnote item exactly there's a reason i didn't make it to step eight of the financial order of operations talking about the 20 to 25 percent because that is where we're freeing you from the 20 to 25 percent because you're going beyond that to where now you can start taking care of the kids college you can start doing the nicer lifestyle choices and then you can eventually even move on to the low paid um, low interest rate mortgage and so forth but um, a lot of people the thing that we have so many highlights on I'm surprised that 99% of the world's population doesn't know this component of ours because we've we've covered it a lot, is the employer portion. Mm -hmm. And I do want you, I want you to be encouraged to include your employer's contributions as long as your household income is less than $200,000. I said household. Household. Uh, You know, that's uh, pay attention to that. And the reason I have that threshold is because the further you move away from the social safety net of Social Security and other benefits, the more the responsibility falls on your shoulders to make sure you have the retirement, you have the discipline to build the wealth needed to sustain that. So you got to pay attention to that. So above that threshold, don't count employer. Below that threshold, count it. And that's probably going to make this a lot easier. We take some flack for the 25%. But look, if your employer is giving you 6 to 8%, All of a sudden, that number dropped way below 20%. Mm -hmm. You can now really start thinking about, hey, maybe I'm closer to this goal that the, the the Money Guy show puts out there. Then I realize, but actually do the exercise of doing the math. When's the last time you sat down? If you're single, you know, do it yourself one night. If you're married, do it with your household, your your spouse. And y'all actually look at each of your incomes, what you're saving, what you're investing, figure out how much is a percentage of your household income you're actually saving and investing for the future. So then you can create a roadmap to make sure if you're not doing everything you should, what can we do tomorrow to get closer to that goal? Let me ask you a specific question, Brian, because we get this all the time. Let's say I'm someone, I'm saving 15%. 
But then I'm taking 10% of my gross income, prepaying my mortgage. Yeah. You know, I'm taking that money and I'm paying off my mortgage. Does that get to count towards my 25% if I'm only saving 15% for the future? This is going to be a little controversial because I know a lot of people think pay, prepaying your mortgage is just the way to add bonds to your portfolio because you're minim minimizing. But I say no. I say Because no uh, the reason I say no is because I always think about, remember this, 20, 25% are resources that are easy to get to if you needed to for either retirement one day, emergency in the current environment that you live in, mortgages, because as I've shared with you, bad news, they're all extroverts. If you think about unemployment, you think about bad markets, you think about real estate dropping, do a, you, you know, all those things hang out together. They, they really are a, a gruesome group of people that have the, 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 the life of the party, but they're also horrible personalities to have hanging out together because when they, they, they come at the same time, it makes access to the equity in your house. If you have not paid off your house at 100%, you might get squeezed. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that I, I, I always tell people, we have no problem with prepaying mortgage debt as long as you're over the 25% saving investment. But you have to make sure you've actually sustained and built the foundation to create the wealth. Don't move to keeping the wealth when you're not even guaranteed or on the path to becoming that wealthy journey. Because I see all kinds of comments from 32-year-olds that are trying to pay off their house as fast as they can. I even think... Because we all know Dave Ramsey loves a paid-for house. Mm -hmm. But a lot of you are doing Dave-ish. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not saving and investing for the future because you just get so hopped up and excited because you paid off your credit cards and now you're hopped up and excited and want to tackle the next biggest debt, which is your mortgage, you might be screwing this up more than you realize by, by, by skipping out on the actual wealth-building component that creates the wealth that will sustain you in retirement. That's great. Really good answer. Remember, if you want to uh, take a look at those nine steps of the financial order of operations for yourself, just go to moneyguy.com slash resources. We've got a free download there for you to check out. Or if you're ready for the deep dive, head to learn.moneyguy.com and sign up for our course and the whole community that's going on there. And we'll answer all of your financial order of operations questions. All right. Speaking of buying a house, Jeremy has a question for you guys. He says, my wife and I are looking to buy our first house soon. We're considering financing for 15 years to get almost 1% lower of a rate with the plan to refinance later. Is this a generally good strategy? What do you think? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, Jeremy. We've been, we've been in this, uh, this time period, really, I'd say for the last decade or so, where it hasn't made a ton of sense to go with 15-year mortgages because when you look at the difference between what you could get the rate on a 30-year versus what you could get a rate on a 15-year, they were all really, really low. And the spread between the two uh, was not incredibly valuable. Now, in this last year or two, as we've seen interest rates begin to rise, I do think we're moving back into that place where, oh man, 15-year mortgages they may in fact be significantly more attractive than a 30-year mortgage. I think what you said here was 1% lower. I don't think that's crazy. I don't think it's a bad idea to consider looking at because you still have a fixed rate mortgage. You're not going out and doing adjustable rate where you have a lot of risk out there. And you do have the opportunity, should rates drop in the future, you can still refinance, which is an exciting option to have on the table. Here's the cautionary tale that I would tell you. You have to make sure that if you do that 15-year mortgage and you run through the calculation, your monthly debt service does not exceed 25% of your gross income. Because if you are trying to stretch it, if you are trying to do that 15-year just to save an interest rate, but you get yourself in a pickle where your monthly note is sucking up so much of your income that it can put you in a bad spot, you may find yourself in a place where all of your wealth is tied up in the house and all of your free cash flow is going towards the house, I don't think that's where you want to be. If you've done the numbers though, and the 15-year mortgage will still keep you in the correct threshold to stay below that 25%, I don't think saving 1% on interest rate is a crazy idea. Did Jeremy give us his age? It's, it's okay. Not. It's um because here's here's the thing. I, I want to be careful because we we eat our own cooking. I mean, I, I make sure that whenever we give advice that we're walking the walk or we historically have walked the walk. And I think about all my big home purchases, and there is an intersection. And because I, I I believe to my heart that twenty five percent is the right amount for housing, so that you don't end up in a house rich life poor yep. situation. However, if I'm being honest. 
There is an intersection point, and this is a comment, especially if you're, because I know a lot of you financial mutants, you're STEM type people, you're either in computer science, you're engineers, you're in finance, you're in, compu- you know, you're doing something that probably has a lot of career opportunity. You need to, now these are dangerous times. I will tell you, we have a lot of technology clients that right now it's, we've had some, some, some people losing their jobs. Mm-hmm. We've had people restructuring their jobs. It's scary out there. So you got to make sure you're on stable, conservative financial ground so you don't get yourself in a pickle of a situation where you're like, how was I such a knucklehead Mm -hmm. that I ran myself so thin? That's why we have the financial order of operations with emergency reserves and all the other things. But I will tell you, if you're somebody who's in your late 20s, early 30s, and you're on this career trajectory where you're getting 15, 20% pay raises every year, you do need to kind of look at this house because I've done this myself. Well, I'll say the goal is 25% housing, but because of unique things that are going on in the world and because I'm considering a 15-year mortgage, because by the way, it is crazy that it's a 1% spread mm-hmm. between these two. That that does move That's that needle a little bit, especially when mortgage rates are 6% versus 5%. Man, that is psychologically and then financially, that's a big difference. Mm-hmm. But realize the 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 payment on that 15 year is gonna be substantially higher than that 30 year. So it's also gonna mean that you're probably buying a smaller house mm-hmm. with the same dollars because the higher interest rate and the, the the 15 year shorter amortization period from the traditional 30 year, but it might make sense, but I'm gonna give you some grace because like I said, I want you to take into account the intersection of your career trajectory versus what is this as a percentage of your income. This could be one of those opportunities where maybe it is 30%, hmm. especially with the interest rates having this weird arbitrage thing going on. So make sure that you chart out and really risk assess yourself on how stable is my job. And if there's two of you in the household working and both of you work in really good, strong fields, maybe it's better. But if you're a, the only person making money and you make a great income that's going to be hard to replace, be very careful because this is a cash flow commitment. And that leads to my third point. Real estate decisions need to be seven to 10 year decisions. That's, right. That's great. If you, Jeremy, if you cannot promise yourself that you can pay this for the next seven to 10 years and you're going to be stable in the area, you're going to be stable in your job, stay the heck away from real estate because it will, it will, because it's still a scary time. Mm-hmm. But I want you, I want you to have the grace and all the things that you need to check the box on. And if you can do that, I think real estate can be a really powerful thing to wealth building, but also peace of mind. And it's nice to have the roots to raise your family in it, but you just got to make sure you do your homework, do the due diligence. So it doesn't make you um, regret and, and miss, feel like you missed out on a lot of things you could have done because maybe you need to move to another job or you've got house rich life poor. There's lots of considerations there. Don't skip the steps, Jeremy. If you are if you are doing the 15-year mortgage and you're thinking, oh, well, I'll just have the opportunity to refinance later on. Maybe. That means that you have in your mind that rates are going to come down. Well, if you believe that rates are going to come down, that same truth would hold with a 30-year mortgage. If I do this 30-year mortgage, and even if it is a percent higher, but I believe that rates will decrease, I'll have an opportunity in the future to refinance down to a lower rate. So I wouldn't... Unless you think that right now, this 15 years, the best rate I'm going to get, I would be very careful stretching yourself too thin and putting yourself in a, in a tight cash flow situation. Yeah, I, I'd be, I, I do think rates will come down eventually. It's just how long. I mean, I saw the Daniel and I, we pro, this is another short idea, by the way, Katie. The CBO, I think last year in 2022, I think they projected interest costs to be like somewhere between four to six hundred billion dollars or whatever and it ended up coming close to a trillion and i think this year is going to be well over i think we're getting close to like 1.3 to 1.5 trillion dollars of carry mm-hmm. costs we'll, we'll ch- get somebody to fact check that that's a great short they're not gonna be able to keep this forever but that doesn't mean that you are waiting for the government to kind of set up your 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 housing decisions if you get the opportunity to refinance that's that's whipped cream on your sunday that's not something that goes into the decision making process love it Great thoughts. Thanks so much for your question, Jeremy. Let's move on to Brian's question. With a Y or an I? With an I. Brian oh, and I. Oh, man. I know. Another Brian. Hello, fellow Brian. <laughs> I think we did this last week, and it might have been the same Brian. <laughs> hey, Brian, again, if this is the same Brian. If, if it's the same Brian, he's Bizarro Brian. <laughs> yeah, Because he right. was Brian J. This is no, Brian J. Is, is this Brian mm-hmm. J? It's Bizarro Brian. Welcome, Bizarro Brian. Yep. Cool. 
now that we've established cool. that we're gl glad you're cool. here. <laughs> She's like, oh, this I already know. <laughs> no, I love it. All right. The question is, if you are someone still decades away and don't know exactly what you might need in retirement, is hyperaccumulation considered met once you've reached that 25% savings of your gross income? Yeah. Hyper, what, what hyper accumulation is, is saving 25% of your gross income. Now, some people run into this place where, okay, I'm doing that, but I'm doing it inside of all my retirement accounts. I'm doing it inside of my maxing out my employer plan and my Ross, my HSAs. I'm not building that after tax bucket. Am I still hyper accumulating? Absolutely. You're still hyper accumulating once you get to that 25% says that that's what we want you to do. Now, as you move through time, Brian J, and as you begin to have some clarity around what that future might look like, you can begin answering questions like, okay, where do I need to have my pots of money? Do, do I need to start building some after-tax bucket because I know that I want to leave the workforce before 55 or before 59 and a half? And you can develop some clarity around those things. But I think if you're hitting 25%, even if you're still decades away from retirement and you're just following the financial order of operations, I would still say that Brian falls squarely into hyper accumulation mode. Yeah, I mean, I want you, I want, I want you to think about what's the why here? Because when you're in your 20s and 30s, your world changes so much. As I've shared with you guys uh, going back. When I was 16, I thought I was buying a, a Corvette when I was 25. When I was 25, I thought I was retiring by 50. Now that I'm close to goal? 50. What's your goal at 50? Uh, now I, my goals have completely changed. So I'm just telling you, but, but I will tell you something I've, I've always been proud of. Having that discipline, that, that ingredient of wealth building, that I was going to live on less than I made, and I was going to create margin that led to saving for the future – was always something that that was driving the uh, the big part of my why. And when you're in your 20s and 30s, it's too hard to know what the end game is going to be because you don't you don't your story is not set yet. You don't know potentially who your spouse is. You don't know who if you're going to have kids. You don't know where How you're going to live. You, have? you don't know if there's going to be some medical condition even with the kids or yourself. I mean, there's all kind of question marks. That your whole life is a big question mark. So you need to save in a, in a, in a very purposeful way, because what you, what the 25% saving investment rate does is it creates margin in your life to where you're building up enough assets while you have the big component of time to start building in the background and nurture your future crop where when you get to your forties, it starts spilling over mm -hmm. because you've now done the hard work so that if you get these curveballs of all these things I've said between the spouses, the kids, the special needs or the medical or whatever else, it doesn't matter because you did the heavy lifting while you were younger and it was so gray on what you were trying to figure out that it all became very purposeful and gave you more of your time so you can, if you want to leave early from work, you can. If you want to leave the field of study to go do something more that you feel like, you know, you were put on this earth to do, you can mm -hmm. because you have the margin, you have the ability. But I would tell you while you're in your 20s and 30s, it's OK to set a percentage goal so that you can be firming up the wealth building apparatus in the background. You know, that army of dollar bills that I'm always talking about. As you get a little bit older, in your late 30s and 40s, this is when you should start spot checking. Mm -hmm. This is when you have started reaching a level of success that if you're focusing on your one best life, why not bring in resources like a financial advisor yep. or somebody? That's why we always talk about the abundance cycle, where we can help you figure out where your blind spots are, figure out your why, figure out where your soft landing is and your risk assessment of what you're doing that is exactly the graduation point of the abundance cycle. And that's why we do have the financial order of operations, because it's going to happen right around that same period of time with the financial. If you go to moneyguy.com slash resources, or you go to learn.moneyguy.com for our course on the financial order operations, you're going to see this is where you, you, you kind of start graduating out where you need a little extra direction to know what I need to do to be successful. And I would, I would remind you, uh, please do not confuse a really stellar savings rate with financial security. Daniel, why don't you put a link in the comments for me? We recently did a show called The Five Levels of Wealth, where we walk through the way that we view wealth. Well, a lot of young folks, we hit these like crazy saving rates. We're saving 20%, 40%, 60%. I saw some of the chat said 70% of their gross income, which is incredible. And that's awesome if you can do that. That does not necessarily mean you're at financial security. So I'd encourage you to go listen to that show. Just because you are hyper accumulating 
does not mean that you have yet arrived. You got to do it for a while to actually build up that financial foundation. Well, I, I, the la- final point, because I know we're running long, but there, I had somebody who was in their 40s who was like, my family's starting to pick on me because we don't do nice vacations. Mm-hmm. I'm saving this. I don't even know why we're saving all this extra money. That's another reason I tell you to do the spot check because yep. you have to really refine what the why. That's why the Know Your Number course is also really valuable because it takes you beyond just a saving percentage to filling in the goals of what you're actually doing this for is because a lot of people, if you are in your 40s and you haven't spot checked, you might be leaving this life of scarcity and and not making memories and building things uh, the, in the best possible way. You, you kind of start resembling more of the miser Ebenezer mm-hmm. Scrooge versus the maximizer of the person that gets into their 50s and 60s and goes, not only do I fulfill all my finan- finan- financial independence goals, but I also made the best of those years that I was raising the family and the messy middle and all the other stuff. Make sure those things are they're, they're the intersections. It's hard to do that in your 20s and 30s. That's why we give you a percentage. But as you get older and you're trying to make sure you don't transition into miser who has all this money but is not actually utilizing it to build memories and other good things that that, that, that this is a tool can do for you, you might be blowing a, a really good long-term thing to know where exactly you are in your journey. Did he just change his YouTube name to Bizarro Brian? Because if so, that's fantastic. Did Thank he? you so much for that. He I did. think he did. <laughs> <Isn't it good? laughs> You've now been done. Well, I don't know. I don't know how old Brian J is, but I if you, it. I mean, my, I still have it. Oh, I just knocked something. Over. I still have it in my house, um, and, and I, it drives me crazy when my wife. Fortunately, we moved from Georgia, so we don't go to the laser show anymore. But she would always pull out my super friends blanket when we'd go to the laser show, and we'd lay on the outside because that's that's my childhood blanket, and it had. The, the, it had the, the whole Super Friends, and then it always had the Legion of Doom or whatever, and had all Bizarro. It, it was, it, I get that visual. I Remember, love it. <laughs> four hours of sleep, Brian. Great. Well, Brian, not Brian J, Bizarro Brian, thank you for being here. <laughs> We're so glad you asked a question. Appreciate you. All right, let's move on to Cranny's question. Cranny? Cranny. <laughs> Cranny. I get, a, I get a visual of Sometimes a grumpy I'm grandma like, eating an apple. This? That's what I was thinking. <laughs> grumpy grandma <laughs> eating an apple. Okay, keep going. I knew you were going to comment on that one. Okay. My wife and I are 36 and work full time. After maxing our Roth IRAs and contributing up to 25% of our income to our 401ks, um, not maxed out, but we have not maxed out our 401ks, to clarify there, should we max them out? Or... Should we go after tax? What's next for them? Man, that's really hard. That's a great question. We, Cranny, we've, we've addressed this a lot because I think a lot of people find, themsel- find themselves in your situation. Like when you work through the mathematics, looking at your household income and you're getting your employer match and you've got a fully funded emergency fund and you're maxing out your Roth IRA and you're maxing out your HSA. And so then you move to step six of the financial, you want to hold it up for me? You move to step six of the financial order of operations and you say, you know what? I actually just hit 25% before I made it to step seven. I didn't actually get to the after-tax account uh, and I've still got a little bit of room left in my 401k. So if I want to save more, if I want to keep saving, should I, Brian, max out the 401k or should I open up the after-tax account? Is there a binary, right, wrong, yes, no answer, or there's some other things I got to think about to figure out the answer. I wish we could have royalty-free music that would play Barry White, because I think that when you get to this stage that, that Cranny's at, this is the sizzly, sexy part of wealth building, is because once you get to saving and investing 25%, and you're trying to figure out, are we doing additional retirement, or are we moving to step seven of the financial order of operations, hyperaccumulation, this is when you get to involve your significant other and y'all start going, hey, we've reached the goals. We've done the 25%. Mm-hmm. Is this now, is this um, is this lifestyle? Is mm-hmm. this after-tax investments? Is this, I mean, ooh, yeah. I mean, I, that's the Barry White stuff. I mean, yeah. that's when you get to really ooh, get yeah. into the fun part of the planning because a lot of this is you're putting in the hard work of building the foundation. It's the basics. Mm-hmm. And that's why I do get so excited, and I actually want to celebrate when you do get to that step seven of the financial order of operations, where you get to kind of now be the the decider of your fate for the future and how you want to utilize the resources and use money in the tool to be the best version of yourself or to make the best memories or leave the best legacy. 
there, there's so much cool stuff that goes on once you reach that level. And that's why I, I would encourage you, please go download at a minimum the financial order of operations Bo's already said at moneyguy.com slash resources. If we go a little deeper into some of the goal planning and other things I know in learn.moneyguy.com. Yep. And then maybe even you even need to, 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 to use the Know Your Number course to, to kind of give you purpose. It's not just to sell products. It really is because I'm trying to give you purpose. Because if you don't know the why, if you don't know what you're doing, um, you got to get that rudder figured out, you know, so that your ship is driving as, you know, most purposefully in the direction that lets you, because you only get one, one life on this planet. Now, I think there's more beyond that. But while you're on this planet, you've got to make sure that you're very purposeful on maximizing. Yeah, I think what's interesting when we've answered this, because again, I'm going to summarize what you just said. It's pretty specialized, right? Like your unique, unique situation is specialized. Depending on those goals and, circumstance, goals and circumstances, we have seen scenarios where the answer was yes, continue to max out the 401k and do it pre-tax to get the current year tax benefit. And we've seen others say yes, continue to max out the 401k, but do it raw so you get the tax-free benefit. And we've seen it, no, don't max out the 401k, start building the after-tax dollars because there's a purpose for that. Without beginning with the end in mind and knowing where you are going, it's really difficult to answer your specific question. So I think both of the tools that you mentioned would be tremendously helpful in helping you figure that out, Cranny. I have a sidebar. I don't know if this turns into a highlight. It's um because this doesn't really fit in the question. I was just sitting here thinking about the oddest meeting, financial planning meeting I ever had with a prospect where somebody came to me, he was single, had no kids, and he had just come into this windfall of money and he wanted to go buy a catamaran to start renting it out in the in the Caribbean. Okay. And he was going to be the captain of it. Okay. You think when you come to a financial planner, I'm going to say that is the craziest idea. You no way know how. But when we got in the meeting, this is the value of, you know, and this is why I love step seven or whatever, when you get to really start thinking about, this was enough level of assets. In the meeting, I was, I basically had him buying a, a ticket down to the Caribbean like, to go start shopping for catamarans. catamarans. But that's why I think a lot of people think financial advisors were always the no people. No, I mean, that's why if you ask me what's the oddest meeting, he didn't become a client because no. I told him to go buy a catamaran. Yeah, go. But, it's, um, <laughs> but, it is, but it's just funny to me because it's just the perfect example of all the cool stuff you get to do once you build abundance and wealth is because you can start doing outside the box stuff. But you got to first paint inside the lines to get your financial foundation underneath you. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, it just kind of tickled me sitting here thinking about that meeting and how odd it was. To basically go tell somebody, yeah, go buy a $2 million catamaran. I don't care. And it worked. And that's great. That's the beautiful thing about money. I love it. Nice sidebar. All right. We're going to move on to Jake's question. Um, there are like three Jakes in the chat today, so it might not even be the Jake that Lots of Jakes know. and Jacobs. Mm -hmm. You know, if the boy band thing comes, we go, Jake, Jake, Jake. Never mind. Keep going. It didn't hit. <laughs> Take that back. Dial it back. A lot funnier up here. Four hours sleep, Brian. Thought that was going to drop like a bomb. <laughs> Dino Mike. Dino Mike. All right. Here's Jake's question. Might be getting that slappy phase of um, I love it. Q and A show. Okay. Jake asks, would you, would love to hear the money guy's view on budgeting for a wedding ring? And mm. where do I save this? For context, he's on step seven of the foo. Mm. This one gives me a little heartburn, Bo. Yeah, no, we <laughs> we've gotten we get we get some negative flack on Well, no, let me let me tell you because look, Hot there's takes. a whole Here industry. Hot takes. The the beers. You know, what is it is a diamond <laughs> valuable? On. You just did. Mike Ditka from Saturday Night Live, the Bears is what you just the did. <laughs> so, I saw, and I don't know if this is true because I know nothing about st stones. I'm just gonna say somebody had posted a short where it said the fifteen thousand dollar synthetic diamond I bought. You can now buy for six hundred dollars or something. Mm. I know synthetic diamonds are different than the real things that De Beers is pulling out of the ground, but it but it is one of those things where. The market would have you. I think they tell everybody, was it two months of income? Uh, that's what I've, I've heard. I've heard two months to as much as four months of, of your like salary, which it's, it's, I don't love that because I mean it, that might get you in a bad financial situation, especially if you're running up a bunch of credit card yep. debt and other things. You need to really pay attention to where you are in your journey. I'll tell you from young, twenty-something year old Brian and Bo, you can give your experience sure. share on this too. 
I was trying to buy a uh, a ring that was nice enough that my wife would know that it was really showing my commitment to her, mm-hmm. but it was also nice enough that if we were going to the place I thought we were going financially, that she'd be set, you know, that she'd be still proud of this ring. Sure. Now here's why this gives me heartburn. I am now getting closer to the fifty, and we live in this neighborhood, and there's all these ladies. I look at it and I'm like, whoa, is that synthetic or is that real? If that's real, holy cow. A lot of love went in that ring. I, I think about, and, and, and it has, I will tell you, it is. My wife has brought up, she's like, maybe we do need, maybe I need, and I was like, no, you don't. Know, remember, I bought this. I have this whole narrative that I share on the show <laughs> that I bought you a ring that was going to be good no matter what no matter station what of life. life. So that's what I'm telling you. This, guys, this is not stop. This whole financial mutant mentality of, doing things so that's why my wife still has the ring from our original mm-hmm. wedding but she's starting to whisper hey, you know what I, you know what because we don't do a lot of jewelry in yeah, my yeah, house yeah. that's right so I, but that's why i say i always want to be very because we eat our own cooking here at the money guy show i'm not a hypocrite i practice what i tell you i do we build our wealth we let our wealth speak for us with the buildings and other things i don't go out there and show you lamborghinis mm-hmm. we actually do it and that's why I, I want to be confessional. When when my wife is whispering into my ear, you know the things that we're having. I'd be curious to know what you think about wedding rings. Yeah. So here's here's what I think is interesting. There, we have a deliverable. Nate, maybe you can even pull this one up. We call it our wealth multiplier. Mm. That shows how powerful your dollars can be, especially for young folks. Brian has a koozie he loves to drink out of. This is one dollar beer. You caught me while I was drinking out of the wrong <laughs> wrong thing. This one dollar beer cost me eight eight dollars because four. A 20-year-old, we know that $1 has the capacity to turn into $88 by the time that you get to retirement. So when you think about this wedding ring, when you think about this thing that you're going to use to propose to your significant other, you ought to think about it in those terms. Like, okay, this is how much I'm going to put this. So if this is like two months, three months, four months of salary, what can that turn into by the time that we get to retirement? Because by the way, I hope that before you get down on the knee and before you ask before you ask the question, will you spend the rest of your life with me? You're thinking, man, I want to be with this person forever. I want to be in retirement with this person. And if I think about in the future, the person I'm in retirement with, and I do the math on how much this ring would have cost us in retirement dollars, will that have been a decision that we were happy about? That had been a decision that, uh, that we thought was a prudent decision together as a household. So I say that on the front end, right? Because I see some people, and man, they do it. They go put, ton- they, they literally go buy a ring that's like five or six months of their salary, but of course they don't have it saved up. So they put it on a credit card and they're paying for it for the first three years. You got to buy paying. insurance on that too. And you got to insure it. And it's just, right, it's this crazy thing. Um, when my wife and I were, were uh, our girlfriend at the time, we're getting serious. And it was looking like marriage was a thing that was potentially on the radar. I started kind of feeling out what would she like, right? Like we were like, we didn't think, oh, hey, we're at the mall. Let's go look at this jewelry store. Now she probably saw through it. I thought I was slick. Uh, truthfully, I'm not very slick, but I knew exactly what she wanted. I knew what kind of stone she wanted, what kind of cut she wanted. So there wasn't a lot of guessing. Well, me as the guy who had to buy the ring, it made it much, it made it much more real for me to say, hey, I don't want to go buy the big ring, the expensive ring, the fancy ring, the showy ring, I know exactly what she wants because she's been very clear. I like this thing and I like this one. And so it allowed me, when I thought about the ring, I, it, whether I paid $1,000 for it or $10,000 for it, I knew that I was buying a ring that she was going to love because she and I had actually looked at them together and we kind of figured that out together. I think if you can go into it that way, and you start saving for it because you don't want to buy this thing on debt and you put the appropriate amount of time into building up for it, I think you can do something like Brian says, buy something that for current stage of life is great and appropriate and fits, but is also something that your significant other is going to love for the next 50, 60, 70, 80 years that you're married. And I think that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Great way to close the show out. Just to be- I know I'm willing to confess my ring that I bought my wife was one month's salary. Okay. I just did it yeah. for what I made at the time. That's great. So That's great. do you do you mind what would you know or is that bad to share that? I I think mine would have mine probably came out to somewhere around between 1 to 2 months. Uh, one Oh, look at you big baller. 
Well, I didn't make a lot of money back then. That's yeah. crap. Oh, it's come not, on. It's you made, no, 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 no. You don't get to do that. I was the person that hired you. I know what you made. You made more money than I made in that stage. Oh, yeah, so it so was, you make it sound like, oh, Ebenezer Bryan wasn't paying Bo anything. It was great, though. Bo like it was, it. It, was, uh, it was appropriate. And fortunately, I had been... I was working for a while, so I had some savings also, right? So I was able to save up for it, and it was one of those things that made it. Make, cause we, I, I think, think it that's was, the key. Like, you don't want to go into debt for it. That's right. You don't, don't want to ruin your financial operations for it. He won't answer, so I will for it. It was a month and probably a week. That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. it was somewhere between one to two. That's Mathematically, it's, that's somewhere between one to two months. It's very I know what I said was his I know. I knew the answer. I was just trying to give him the chance to tell you guys. So I, I, I'll what would you do if I'd agree? Be like, oh, it was 10 months. Would you have called me out if I'd have totally lied? Yeah, I would have called you out. That's the problem with us knowing each other's thoughts. Oh, I love it. Oh, man. Hey, but by the way, congratulations. Thinking about getting married, thinking about... It's a huge decision. Deal. It's probably one of the most significant, awesome, amazing decisions you'll ever make. So I hope that you're uh, that you're putting a lot of thought and uh, good for you for trying to think about it the way that a financial mutant would think Yeah, about it. and you and the other Jakes, y'all start trading um, messages on what <laughs> instruments y'all play and y'all get Jake, Jake, Jake back together. That's hilarious. <laughs> I love it. Well, thanks so much for your question, Jake. Hopefully that helps you out, gives you some food for thought. All right. Moving on to Strange Corgi's question. Strange Corgi? <laughs> like the dog? Yes. Okay. She said Corgi. I did. She said Corgi. Did. Oh, she didn't say Corgi. She said Corgi. Well, that sounds well, like a... Strange Corgi. I'm sorry. Here's the question. Yep. Thank you. I'm not sure you've covered this before. But how should I approach life insurance for children? Mm-hmm. Should you buy life insurance for your children? And if so, how much? Well, here's the thing. It's only a few bucks a month, right? Like you could get life insurance for, it's so cheap. It's cheaper the younger the child is than it will be for their entire life. That's often the story that you hear. This is what, Strange Corgi, I would like for you to think of. What is the reason that we buy life insurance? What is the purpose of getting life insurance in place? And as someone who used to be on the insurance side of the industry, what we learn in school and what we're taught is that the reason that you buy life insurance is because someone in your life is depending on you for their well-being. They're either depending on the assets or depending on the income for their well-being. So you have an insurable need if you have a spouse, significant other, if you have a dad, if you have children. There are other circumstances that if you were not here, there are obligations that are necessary. So that's the premise of having an insurable need on someone's life. Well, now the question becomes, okay, when you think about your child, when you think about the, a young child that, you know, maybe was just born like two or three days ago, is there an insurable need on their lives? And no depending on their financial creation to provide. And every time I go through the scenario in my head, there's not, there's not a need to be able to replace that child's income or that child's ability to provide. Um, so I am a proponent that I do not think it makes sense to buy life insurance on children agree or disagree well no, I, I mean i definitely don't i didn't buy insurance on either one of my kids but but i do i mean i will tell you it's funny we just did a whole wedding ring question i love because i get to turn a negative like talking about death into a positive talking about getting married um my parents were like your typical parents they got sold some permanent life insurance on me when i was born and then the two thousand dollars of my wedding ring came from cash from value. That. Yes. Well, okay. Well. Uh, so, but but that doesn't mean that's good. There's no no. That's not good though. Bo, that is horrible. Meaning it could that have means come my from poor else. parents who did not. Their idea of investing was CDs. Never really built. They were great at saving money, but not great at maximizing and turning money into wealth. Mm-hmm. Was that th- this is another you know trap that they fell into where somebody sold them a product that probably they should have been buying instead of $50 a month going to bronze life insurance that he used $2,000 to for cash value that $50 a month should have been buying an in, 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 uh, you know, an investment fund that could have made them a million dollars, you know, or half a million dollars closer to financial independence for them by investing into mm-hmm. an, a, a mutual fund or something. So Bo just, he, he, that took the biggest chunk of meat when he said, what's the why mm-hmm. on what you buy insurance for? And these kids, they consume your resources. They don't actually create income unless mm-hmm. you got Macaulay Culkin back in his day when he was doing home alone and stuff. Most kids are, are consuming what you're creating. Um, 
So you're not replacing their income. The the biggest thing you're probably the why is burial costs. Like and that's expenses, sad. Yeah, yeah. And that's sad to think about. So there is a, a cost there, but that's why if you want to take this into account, you can look at your emergency reserves and go, hey, if and I had a, a co- this type of cost come my way, and and if you can plan for that, I mean, it's it's kind of morbid because, um, you know, but there, death unfortunately is one of those things that there's a big reward or discount, I should say, if you pre-plan for it mm-hmm. versus waiting until the death occurs and then buying everything at, at the the forced moment that you have to pay for all the services. Uh, that's, a, that's a morbid thing because these products are sold through fear. And here's the good news. Most kids don't die. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's a very cost-effective thing. And that leads to my third point on this is, I think I always thought it was weird that this always falls into the permanent insurance mm-hmm. category because... This is a term. Your kids are only in your house for that. 18 that, to that 20 years. 18 to 20 years. The burial cost is your commitment. Because like I said, they're consumers of your resources. They're not you know, adding to your, your balance sheet or your income statement for your household. So that's, a, that's a, 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 a period of time that you can measure. Why would you buy permanent insurance on that? That's, mm-hmm. that's just always a weird thing. Most people are going to use it like I did to buy their wedding rings yep. or start. But if you want to do that, you could open a custodial much account. Better vehicles for that. And you could put $50 a month into it, you know, and, and come out or five twenty nine. dollars there, There's or, uh, you know, once they start working, you could do a matching funds for mm-hmm. a custodial Roth account. There's all kind of cool things in there. Life insurance for kids is one of those things. Just ask yourself what the why is. That's I'm right. not saying no. It's just, but just make sure that that's the big thing about insurance. You have to match up what the goal is, the why, with what your needs are personally. And that's why I was I was following all kind of um, Jeremy over personal finance. Personal finance club. He has been now. It's not kids insurance, but he bought and I think it was an indexed um, universal life policy or something like that. And he has been ripping them up. I mean, because he bought a policy to actually show them how that he bought a policy so that he could see yeah. all the inner workings. And it's fascinating to kind of follow that type of content and see somebody who goes in on the inside kind of as like an undercover sting mm-hmm. operation and then tells you because he's Rob wired the right are. way mentally as a, as a you know, mm-hmm. as a software guy who's now wired like an engineer type mindset that he can go in there and, and, and look at this stuff. Yeah, I, I think it's brilliant. So just understand the why. Don't let somebody sell you on the fear of this. Great. Thanks so much for your question, Strange Corgi. I said it correctly that time. All right. Moving on to Stephen's question. He says, is it fair to count employers' pension contribution, which is 20%, when calculating 25% savings rate that you talk about if we make under 200 k all right. Is it fair to count the employer's pension contribution, which he said was 20%? That's what he wrote in parentheses. Stephen, if you have a clarification, I'll watch for it in the chat, of course. It works but for the yes. government. It works. But mm-hmm. so here's, so, so I'm just, I'm, I want to follow the line of thinking and then I want to, I want you to answer the question, Brian. If the, if my company or, or the entity uh, to who, with which I, for whom I, which I work, if the entity that I work for, I don't know that came out weird, is putting 20% in. That means all I got to save is 5% and 25%. Is that, that's like where the rationale is the line of thinking going, right? I, and so I guess mathematically, yeah, you can arrive at that place. Okay, great. There's 25% of what I make going towards that. But it seems to me there's just like a lot of, you're, you're putting a lot of um, faith and a lot of weight in a future promise that is yet to come to fruition. Now, odds are if it's government and odds are it's going to be there. But what I would say is, hey, if they're putting in 20% and you're thinking, I'm only going to put in five, well, what would happen if you start saving 20, 25% on your own? What additional doors would that open? What additional flexibility would you have earlier on in life if you knew you had this fat pension sitting at the, out there, but then you also had all of these assets built up? How might your 40s, 50s, 60s look different if you're able to just double team it from both sides of the equation. So pension is 60% of the income. Um, and the he's, uh, or it might be his wife, but this is a teacher uh-huh. pension. Okay. Got uh-huh. it. Teacher mm-hmm. pension. Got it. So, so I have a few thoughts on this and this is where I love it because it, normally I listen to nonfiction, but I've been going through this phase where I listen to Jack Reacher books and I love it because um, Jack Reacher is like encyclopedia Brown, but he, kicks butt too because you know he, he has this deductive reasoning where he always can figure stuff out but then if things don't go right he just goes and smashes some heads to figure out stuff so it's it's a cool series um 
So this feels a little bit like it because I feel like Jack Reacher without the brawn that um, I see a red flag here. And I want to be honest with Stephen is that, look, I think it's great for you and your family that they're doing 20 percent. But um, because you only had to put in 5 percent, especially because your household's under um, the 200,000. But there's a red flag here. If the government, because I've been involved in government, so I know this red flag, it's this experience. If they're having to put 20 percent in, that means they have an unfunded they have a really underfunded mm-hmm. pension plan um, because I've been part of one of those plans where in a lot of municipal governments, a lot of teacher funds and other things have really realized that some of the assumptions they made back in the 70s, the 80s and the 90s, they might have been a little rosy mm-hmm. on what they were putting. So now they're kind of desperate to shore these things up. So they've had to create these crazy funding formulas where they're putting 14 percent, 20 percent like you're showing. That is great for you in this moment in time. However, it could be that they are also a sign it, of it's, it's a sign that, that, that this thing is not on stable financial ground, that they have to fund it at such a level. So I would just encourage you. It's great for you now, but it's also one of those things where it could go away tomorrow. And I would hate for you be in the situation where your consumption of your lifestyle is built on that you get to spend after taxes 95 percent of whatever comes in. And then all of a sudden the gov- the, sh- the music stops, you try to find the chair, and, the, not you, and you can't you. do it because you've already accounted for every dollar in your budget going towards consumption and housing and everything else. Just be careful because um, because that, that could be a, a, a thing to plan for. So I'd probably go a, a more balanced, moderate approach. You don't have to save 25% yourself if your employer's putting in 20%, but maybe you and your, your spouse should work to try to be saving you know, 15% of yeah, your gross sure. income. That's great. Um, just so, because that's going to give you more margin, so you have more options in the future, um, but it gives you a lot more freedom, and, and good on you that you're getting that extra money, but I do want you to be careful. What does this mean that they're putting 20% in? Mm-hmm. That means that there is, there is this is a symptom of something going on <laughs> that they're trying to catch up and fix. Yep. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that question. And thank you, everybody, for your questions today. Seriously, we so appreciate that you come here every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Central and just talk finance with us and hopefully get some clarity and uh, get your answers to your questions broken down and hopefully help you make these important financial decisions and really just kickstart and continue on your path to wealth. So we'll be back here next Tuesday and we look forward to it. Oh, I'm your host, Brian Preston, <laughs> four hours sleep run. Woo. Mr. Bo Hansen, my God team, go sleep a lot better tonight. Out. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>